My name is Stephen Fluin. I'm a developer advocate on the Angular team. Uh, so what that means, my role is that I'm responsible to help make developers and businesses be successful with Angular uh, and to understand what it's like to be an Angular developer in the real world so that we can reflect those needs onto the team. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I work with a lot of our partners. I speak at a lot of conferences. Uh, I work with people building things in the ecosystem. I run our GDE program, so that's our certification program for people that are awesome in Angular and, and building communities and sharing their expertise with the world. Uh, and I try and do whatever we can to make sure that developers are having a great experience and a great time with Angular. Yep. Awesome. All right. So has, does anyone have any questions for Steven? Uh, Thank you very much. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's coming up with new with Angular? So I heard Angular 2 came out not too long ago. It, when yeah. is Angular 3 coming out? Angular 3 is not coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Denver wouldn't allow it. Uh, but Angular 6 is coming out soon. So maybe we can talk about uh, some of the new stuff that's coming. Sure. And, and maybe even just a, a brief primer in terms of how we number and how we version yeah. things. Yeah. Um, so we have basically time-based releases. So every six months, we're going to increment the major version. Um, and our goal is to hit you with enough versions that you basically stop worrying about the version number. Uh, <laughs> So what that means is that uh, we're going to reserve all breaking changes to basically twice a year. Um, and then outside of that, we'll have minors, so like 5.1, 5.2. Uh, and then what will happen is uh, after the last minor, then we start working on the next major version. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Angular is that uh, the latest commit to master is actually the version of Angular that's in use across all of Google. So the day after we released version 5.0.0, we started working on uh, 5.1.0 beta, and then 5.1.0 RC, and then we released 5.1.0. Um, but all along that process, Google was using whatever the latest commit was on master. So we actually have really good validation across a, a huge kind of code base with more than 500 projects using Angular uh, with every commit. So we, we have a deep understanding when we change something, uh, what effects it's going to have on the ecosystem. And we use that as kind of one of the primary validation mechanisms we have. Uh, and then we also have the the RC period. So uh, I'm always a little bit, uh, I laugh a little bit to myself when I see uh, news articles and Reddit posts saying like Angular 6 beta is out when really like there's no difference in the first beta. There's a week of work between the first beta and the last minor. So people are always like really excited to see what's in it. And we're like, it's not built yet. We'll tell you when it's ready. And I, I heard, aren't you working on a um, Angular CLI is working on like an update, automatic update command? Yeah. So so we are in the beta period for six zero. Um, one of the things we're doing differently with this release is that we are aligning the versions between the CLI Angular material. Uh, and Angular. So the the idea is uh, before we had kind of different versions of each thing. So you have Material uh, two or five or whatever, and then you had CLI one point seven, and you had Angular six. We're we're trying to get rid of a bunch of those version numbers uh, and align everything on the majors. So every six months we'll do a release of CLI, uh, Angular Material, and Angular. So one of the features in six that we've been working on um, in a an initial preview or an initial revision came out uh, already in the CLI. Uh, which is this kind of magical ng update command. So how many people here have ever struggled with uh, knowing what the latest version of Angular, Zones, Material, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you should be using at the same time? Anyone? OK. So we built ng update to solve this problem. So the idea is that you run ng update, and we will move you to the latest version uh, or walk you through the process to move to the latest version, including kind of all of your dependencies. Uh, so we do that a little bit today. So if in the latest version of CLI, you run ng update, uh, we'll update your package JSON to the latest versions of Angular, uh, RxJS, Zones, those sorts of things. Um, but as of 6.0, we're really trying to lean into that a little bit more. Uh, and we're doing a couple things. So uh, now, not only are we updating your package JSON, we'll actually apply a bunch of the updates for you. Uh, but not only that, we're using schematics under the hood and so if any of these packages have said, hey, uh, here's a, a transform that I can do to your code to keep you up to date, it will automatically run that transform. So a good example of this is uh, RxJS. Uh, they ship some updates that uh, allow better tree shakeability, smaller bundle sizes, uh, but it's work for developers to adopt those changes. And so 
uh, an example of helping developers with that breaking change, uh, we can build a schematic for RxJS, um, and we're planning on, on launching with this. So when you run ng update and you go to version 6, we'll automatically be updating some of your code for you, if, if you want that, of course. It sounds pretty cool. Yeah, and then I mean, uh, it's it's even cooler than that. And, uh, I think we won't see the true fruition of this goal um, until kind of future releases. But uh, any dependency you're using in your package JSON in your your project can actually ship their own schematics. And so, if for example you're using Clarity or Kendo or whatever third party dependency you're using, uh, if they add a an update schematic, we will apply all of those for you. And so imagine Angular apps that just stay up to date without you having to do much. You just run one command over and over. Do, do we have schematics in Google 3? Is that? Uh, it's coming soon. OK. <laughs> this is a really good case of where uh, we want to kind of unify the worlds of Google and the world outside of Google, because we have all these really nice things outside the world, like the CLI and schematics and things like that, uh, that Googlers don't get to take advantage of yet, uh, because we have this kind of very big, very Google-specific uh, build infrastructure. Uh, but from the same token, we want to take the best of what Google has in terms of like incremental compilation, et cetera, and bring that to the world. Um, so we, uh, that's what, one of the kind of exciting projects for the future. You, you've probably heard the term uh, ABC before, where we talk about things like our, our build infrastructure built on something called Bazel. Um, and so uh, that's not quite ready. <laughs> I'll say that that's still early days. Uh, just because Bazel is a, a very kind of big, powerful tool that Google's been working on for a long time. Uh, and so making it uh, as easy as or integrated with Webpack is not entirely straightforward. Um, one of the kind of big mentality shifts we're trying to bring to the, the JavaScript ecosystem uh, is uh, individual compilable units. So when you package any sort of project with uh, Webpack, what you're going to see is that Webpack needs to know about all the dependencies and the entire structure of the entire application uh, all at one time. It has to it uses that tree kind of over and over and over. Uh, but that means that you can't have two teams working on projects independently with their own build uh, compilation. And it also means really long build times because you can't take advantage of things that have been built before. Uh, but what we have in Google is that you can actually build every module independently. And then uh, when you build something, it pulls in another module. You don't have to recompile that module. So. We're, we're looking at trying to unify these two worlds in the long term, because we think that that's how we can kind of uh, pull the whole web ecosystem into the future. All right. Uh, yeah, question from Jay. Hey, Steven. So this is TJ from the NativaScript team. So first of all, thanks for the Kender UI oh, shout out. No, no, oh, I, have a, I even have a mic. So thanks for the Kender UI shout out. Another progress project, by the way. So I appreciate that. I did have a question. I, I heard on Twitter, so I'm going to assume it's true. There was some there was some experimental work at drastic, some experiment to drastically reduce the initial payload of Angular apps. Uh, is there any work related to that? I guess what's the status of that? Sure, sure. So we are always looking to uh, decrease the payload size or increase uh, initial load performance. Um, we're doing a few things on that. So things like the tree shake ability, I think, are a, a big deal. Um, but also, so like by removing parts of the application that you're you're not using, uh, we we're going to make your initial bundle size smaller. Um, the other big thing that we're doing is we're actually working on a rewrite of our view engine. So this is not as scary as it might sound to some people. We actually did this between versions two and four. Uh, and most people didn't notice. Uh, but this one is really focused on how do we get bundle size down. Uh, we call this Project IV. Um, and so the the first and primary goal is backward compatibility. Um, but then we're, we're rethinking a lot about how uh, applications get bundled uh, as part of that view engine so that the theory is if you don't use features of Angular, they won't get included in your application. So uh, if we have like a, a very small Hello World app, it won't get bigger just because Angular has more features, right? It'll only be when you use those features that your bundle size gets bigger. We, we are hoping for uh, possibly hundreds of kilobytes smaller, which would be amazing. I think we, we'd all be very happy to see this. I think it's like 3.2 kilobytes now. For Hello World. For, for yeah, I mean, with, with a custom build script and a handwritten Hello World, yes, it is 3.2 kilobytes. I, I'm always, so the team is very excited, and, and like they, 
they have really lofty goals, which I, I absolutely love. I'm always a conservative. I'm, I'm a bit wait and see until it works on my apps. Yeah. Um, but the, the theory is definitely sound. Uh, and so we will see sizes decrease dramatically. Uh, hey, Steven. Uh, this uh, is, yeah, let's see, I'm too close to the mic. So let me maybe go over here. Oh, is there an echo on your side? No, it's great. Do you need me to mute myself? Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, I was wondering if there's any more support planned for, or if there's support coming for uh, developing libraries and with the CLI or otherwise. Uh, currently, we're relying on tools like ng Packager or Angular Librarian uh, for those. And they seem to be working OK, but we don't want to get too invested if there's any plans soon for a Google-supported way for doing this, an Angular-supported way. Sure. So we're doing a couple things right now uh, in the CLI to work on library support. So um, we've developed something called, the, internally, we call it the build facade that makes uh, ng build, ng serve more flexible. Um, and so our hope is that we're actually going to be able to integrate ng packager um, out of the box so that you can build a library project and then you can, uh, or you can like write a, a, or start a library project and you can build that and distribute that library package uh, using something like ng packager under the hood. Uh, but then you're initiating it and managing all that by the CLI, which you're very used to. So uh, that is coming in the, the very near term. Uh, additionally, we, we're also having, uh, we have very similar rules uh, set up for Bazel. Uh, and this is where you get kind of that incremental compilation and some of those kind of distributed build benefits uh, that come with Bazel. And so uh, I think the primary thing people will end up using in our kind of initial launch is ng Packager, uh, just because it it works really well today with tools that people kind of know and are already familiar with. Um, but I think for a lot of large companies, the the availability of Bazel as an option to do that uh, via the CLI will be really exciting. As a slight follow up to that, um, I know like I think it was 1.5 of the CLI uh, support was removed for using Node. Let's see, it was uh, for exporting. It was exporting APIs from the Node modules folder from within. Uh, I don't know if this is a TypeScript change or a CLI change, but essentially, you cannot export from a Node modules folder from within a module. So it kind of made us change our workflow a little bit for a library that we're using. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a better way to be doing that, I guess. So yeah, I wasn't the one exactly working on it, but I know it had some issue with NPM linking the library we were using so we could test the development live for a separate app than the actual repository. Sure, so I, I don't actually know about that specific issue. Normally how I, I've seen most library authors do this, and, and it is very flexible today. You can kind of structure your project however you want if you uh, set up the, the CLI config right. But how I see most people do it is they generate a CLI project, and then there's basically two projects in that workspace. So they've got uh, an app, which is a demo or documentation site that uses the library to, to validate things. That's where they run the end-to-end -end test suites. Um, and then in another folder, like a lib folder, you actually have the library itself. And so the app is going to be doing a direct import of the library module. Um, and then the library is standalone so that you can, using something like ng Packager, ship a redistributable thing that you can NPM link into another project. Uh, that's how most people do kind of primary core development, so that uh, when you do NPM link it into another project, uh, it's, it should be coming in directly just like it will be for your consumers of your library, um, so that you don't have any of those weird re-exporting a node module uh, library. So I, I, I've not heard of that issue. Um, but definitely, if there is a bug there, we'd love to look into it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wait. There it is. First, uh, last guy that was speaking there. Nice hoodie. <laughs> um, I was curious what the uh, status of Angular Elements are or is. Sure, sure. So uh, Angular Elements, uh, in it's landed in master, at, at least in kind of some form. Uh, our hope is that with the 6.0 release, uh, we'll be solving the, the first of several use cases. And so this use case is using Angular Elements to do kind of self-bootstrapping of static HTML. 
Uh, the, the use case in particular we have in mind is uh, when you have an Angular element and you or a custom element and you want to use it in an existing Angular application. So one of the things we do on the AIO website, Angular.io, which is where our docs, our news, et cetera, goes, um, is we load content uh, basically from Markdown files. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to, uh, when you load, for example, a code snippet, uh, to make that a rich code snippet so that we can do syntax highlighting, we can do coloring, uh, we can add a little copy button. Uh, and so we wanted that to be an Angular component. So previously what we were doing is we were manually on load of that content, going and finding all the DOM nodes that had these code snippets and then replacing them with Angular components. Uh, but now that we can just make that code renderer, that code preview, uh, an Angular element or web component, uh, we will just pass in the injector into that component or it will just look for the injector from kind of the, the parent scope because it's within an Angular application. Uh, and then it will bootstrap itself using that that kind of web component platform <coughs> mechanism. Uh, so that's that's the first case we're we're solving. So it's an Angular element inside an Angular application. So we don't have to worry about redistributing the Angular pieces and, and worrying about uh, passing around or multiple injectors, multiple Angular apps, kind of bootstrapping on top of each other. Uh, and then we'll be solving the the harder challenges of making the giving you kind of an ng build element. Uh, style command that allows you to ship that new another person's application uh, after that. Excellent. Hey, Stephen, this is Mohi. Uh, just wondering about the future of uh, uh, Angular CDK. Is there any updates coming uh, on this, like uh, grid start types or something like that? Uh, sure. So I mean, the CDK is a, a very, very active project right now. Um, I think we're about to ship, or if we, I don't know if we already did, uh, things like tree. So the, the new tree component. Uh, so we have an unstyled version of the CDK so that it's reusable. And then we, we're going to have a styled material design version in Angular Material. Uh, so I would continue to expect to see lots of great new things in the CDK. Um, for those of you who don't know, so the component dev kit is a project out of the material design team where they're taking all of the behaviors uh, that they figured out and kind of solved for developers uh, and then shipping them uh, in a way without the design that comes from material design so that anyone who's building a component library can use a, a standard uh, with all of our solved problems, whether that's uh, bi-directional content, whether that's overlays where you have kind of fundamental problems uh, balancing the, the locality of the code with the problems of locality with the within DOM. Does that answer the question about what's, I, I didn't give any specifics about what's coming up in the CDK, but it, it is a active project with uh, more and more cool things coming. Uh, and it's been synced up into the major version release cycle. So the CDK should be seeing a version 6 with Angular uh, version 6. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Steven. Um, you mentioned GDE. Uh, could you tell us more about that? Like, maybe, well, I know I can, but um, can any? Uh, what is that process like? And uh, do we have any GDEs for Angular in Seattle? Uh, I don't know if we have any in Seattle. Let me check quick. Maybe we should. Uh, maybe we should. Uh, so the, the GDE program, it's a Google Developer Expert. Um, and so the, the genesis of the program was uh, people wanted, uh, communities wanted to hear about Google products. Um, but if Googlers went out and spoke about all of our, our products every time we were asked to, we would basically never write another line of code. We'd just be out giving talks at, at meetups uh, every day forever, The whole every team everywhere uh, like that. This applies to Android, Chrome, uh, Web, Angular, a lot of the TensorFlow uh, stuff like that. Uh, and so what we do is we've set up this program where uh, people that are already in the community, they're already speaking, they're already blogging, they're already building code samples, tutorials, mentoring, consulting, uh, if they, they hit a certain level of kind of impact in the community, uh, and then they, they are also technically uh, savvy in terms of what's going on in a specific technology, uh, we will certify those individuals uh, as GDEs. Uh, and then that, that's a kind of a badge they can use uh, to say, hey, uh, you can trust me a little bit. I'm, I'm certified by, by Team X. Uh, I think right now we have something like 50 or so uh, Angular GDEs, uh, maybe even 56. Uh, we, we recently had a bunch of people added to the, the program. Uh, I think the program is is growing right now, uh, not as fast as probably it was earlier this year or even the, the end of last year. Um, but the best way to become a GDE is actually to kind of just be out in your community uh, and then get recognized or recommended by another GDE. 
So let me check here who is the, the nearest. We've, we've got a bunch of GDs here in the, the Bay Area, uh, as well as kind of across the US and across the globe. Uh, I'm pulling up the list here. Uh, you can also, if you're curious about who are GDEs, I think it's developers.google.com slash experts. And we've got a, a list of all the experts broken down by technology and location. So does it mean uh, that you have to find another GDE to recommend you, or can you find a Googler to recommend you? You can find a Googler. Uh, I always just say that it's easier to find a GDE to recommend you. Okay. <laughs> OK. Just curious. And then uh, I mean, the, the limits to the program are based on uh, regions. So like, there's a North America region who has a limited capacity of how many people they can add. So that, that's one of the primary limiting factors. I'm not seeing any in Seattle. Maybe there's a big opportunity there, because Seattle's quite the tech hub. Hey, Steven, Mike here. So what are you most excited about when it comes to Angular 6? Uh, what am I most excited about? NG update. I, I don't want to type npm install at Angular slash left curly bracket core common compiler, compiler CLI platform, platform browser, dynamic platform, uh, animations, HTTP, router, forms, right curly bracket, enter. <laughs> I've, I've typed that probably. Two, three hundred times now, and if I never have to type that again, that would be too soon. You don't have a command for that? I've written it so many times, but it's never there when I need it. Because I switch computers a lot. We do have a command, it's a ng update. <laughs> so what can you tell us about Angular Elements? Sure, I, I, I think I, we covered it a, a little bit in the, the last question. So Angular Elements is the idea that uh, I should be able to take a component of my application and ship it as a web component uh, or a custom element. Uh, the idea there being that you don't necessarily need Angular in order to consume one of these uh, components, uh, but it should still work like an Angular application. I should still have dependency injection within the context. Uh, I should still have HP if I want it, services, providers, those sorts of things, so that I can still write my application like an Angular developer, uh, but then take that code further in terms of making it either redistributable. So if I have a, a weather widget that I want to ship onto other uh, people, whether I have another team in my company that doesn't use Angular and they want to use some of my components, uh, or even if I just, within my own Angular application, I want to be able to use HTML to bootstrap uh, additional functionality. <laughs> Steven, this is Jens again. Uh, I was curious if, uh, has there been any lifespan put on the upgrade module, or is there still full plan support for that going forward in 6 and beyond? Uh, you mean uh, uh, NG upgrade? I believe it's called, I believe, uh, upgrade, uh, NG upgrade, I think, was in version uh, beta of 2, and now it's called upgrade module, right? Uh, uh, running a hybrid app with AngularJS and Angular. Yes. Either way, it's called. Uh, no, uh, you're you're probably right. Uh, I would just call it ng upgrade because that's that's what the team calls it. Um, I, I don't. I'm not aware of any plans to deprecate that. Uh, we know that there are millions of Angular or AngularJS developers still out in the wild um, who could use help to get up to Angular. Um, and so I, I think that's something we're going to continue to look at, uh, including the the ng upgrade. All right. So I, I don't know if you, because we, we've actually fixed a, a ton of issues with that over the last six months, uh, including being able to blacklist certain zone events so that you don't have your AngularJS application triggering Angular change detection when you don't want it. Um, you can actually now run zone lists entirely. So if you don't want um, zones to be doing triggering any change detection, you want to manage that yourself, we've got that. Um, we also announced uh, ng upgrade light, which basically uh, puts limits on how you can upgrade and downgrade components and services, uh, but then it, it runs them in completely different contexts. So uh, you don't have to worry about any, any again, change detection or digest cycle uh, negative impacts. So it, it's something we're continuing to work on. Um, we actually have a few teams within Google uh, that with kind of hundreds of developers that are using ng upgrade right now. Um, so anytime they uh, have a problem, need something, 
uh, that will just happen in, in our GitHub repository, and then that'll be shipped out to everybody else. I haven't checked the docs in a while, but are the uh, docs up to date with the latest information on that? Do you know? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, to my knowledge. Uh, and I, I was going through them earlier this week. All right. If, yeah, I haven't checked them in a long time. Wrong, so Let us know. We, we do want to yeah. help. We do want to make things better. Uh, one of my, my goals is actually to bring someone on uh, this year to, to focus entirely on that problem. <laughs> so is, I, it, uh, is, it, is that excitement in the crowd or is that terror? Yeah. <laughs> there was a volunteer. <laughs> I don't know. Anyone here want to help? <laughs> on the documentation issue? I, I would say it, it is both a documentation, uh, a communication, storytelling, and a technical problem. Uh, there's a lot of different pieces to getting from AngularJS to Angular. Uh, I mean, more than half of it is just a lot of the AngularJS code was written when we were all much younger and less experienced developers not writing as good code as we do today. <laughs> OK, so Steven, I uh, heard we're back. Uh, the new version is like three times faster. Is there any news like Angular CLI or start using this? Yeah, no, we we are uh, we worked very closely with the Webpack team prior to the the 4.0 launch, um, and while I think there's still some bugs in some of the plugins for Webpack 4, uh, we are planning to ship with Webpack 4. Thank you. Yeah, so as soon as 6 6.0 comes out, uh, we'll be using Webpack 4 under the hood. Uh, and our idea, idea with the CLI is that it's it's a bit of a black box, um, aside from kind of what we're exposing with the the new build facades. Uh, so you'll be able to take advantage of all those benefits, so the sco scope hoisting, so the, the kind of smaller bundle size uh, that Webpack is able to achieve, uh, plus any speed or performance improvements uh, without having to do anything. You keep writing Angular, and we'll keep making everything better. Sweet. Uh, hi. Uh, can you tell us about the material? Is any a future for the material, Angular material? How stable going to be, and how is development going through the material? Uh, it's going to be very stable. So uh, one of the things that, that if you look at the Angular team, um, we have about something like, uh, and I'm going to get these numbers off by a couple, so, so forgive me, but it's something like eight people working on the framework. We've got like six people working on the CLI, and we have something like uh, six or seven people working on material. So uh, it's actually a huge part of how we spend our time. So there, there's a lot of investment going on there. Um, and they're syncing up to our major versions. So uh, they'll be making, uh, I don't I don't think they have any meaningful breaking changes in six. Um, but they they're, they keep building new components. They, they keep looking at ways of making the, the world a better place, uh, such as this tree component, which I think is coming out. Uh, I think if you check their GitHub repository, they also have uh, a roadmap published of kind of the components they're intending to build. Uh, but Angular Material is very stable. It's actually been very stable since way before they they shipped kind of uh, their 2.0.0. Uh, they were calling it 2.0.0 beta for a long time, but it was uh, it's actually one of the most stable component libraries I've ever used. Yeah, so uh, if I pulled up their roadmap, it, and you can find this just in the GitHub repository in the README, uh, they, they're going to add more uh, features to data table, um, kind of new ways of binding. Uh, they want to have action lists planned for 2018, uh, sticky headers. Uh, one of the big things we're working on is virtual scrolling, so that whether you're in a data table in a uh, MD select, uh, we want to automatically virtual scroll for you so that we're not rendering all of the DOM elements at the same time time. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with virtual scrolling is how do you have accessibility with virtual scrolling? Because if a screen reader only knows about five of your 1,000 elements, uh, that's not going to be a very good user experience. right? So th these are the kind of challenges that we're, we're solving for, for the components. Any specific questions about material, or what, what causes you to ask? Uh, I had some problem after I upgrade my from Angular JS to Angular 2 Plus, and I have some breaking changes in Material which I abandoned it totally, and I want to come back to Material again. That's why I want to be sure it's stable now. Yes, so so coming from Angular JS Material to Angular Material, um, we learned a lot of lessons in Angular JS that we applied uh, in in Angular Material. 
Um, so, but it is, it's definitely very, very stable now and, and has been for more than six months. And uh, one of the things that, that you're going to see more and more from us is when we do need to make a breaking change as much as possible, we're going to tool it for you. So one of the, the changes that we did prior to shipping kind of 200 of material was we had to rename all of our selectors. So before it was like MD button and we needed to change it to MAT button. Um, but what we did for developers at the same time was we released a tool that automatically did this for you across your TypeScript, your CSS, and your HTML. Um, and we heard amazing, overwhelmingly positive feedback about that, that it basically worked for everyone uh, because this was the tool we used inside of Google to migrate all of the usage of these things uh, for Google developers. And then we just uh, released that tool open uh, so that anyone could apply this and then it would automatically update the prefixes for you. And so our thought is not only do we want to not make very many breaking changes or avoid them whenever possible, we want to make tools that automatically do this for you. And that would be something that would automatically be invoked in the future with a command like ng update. And any changes on implementation of the material or the same way it was before? Uh, it, it might not be the same way it was in AngularJS material, but it's been the same for a year plus, I think, for most of the components. And modular where you can actually have a module and export it to the import it to the, your app module. Yes. OK, thank you. Yep. Steven, this is Kendrick, from Kendrick Burst, and I work at T-Mobile. And I have a team there that uh, was doing some POCs uh, using Angular Material JS and then converting them over to Angular Material uh, 4. Um, and they ran into some problems that there, there's not a feature parity between the two. Is there a, a roadmap of when that's going to go? And then secondarily, um, we had a problem using Angular Material with server-side rendering, with a uh, universal Angular, that there was an actual defect that it, it uses the window object, which doesn't exist when you're in platform browser. So I don't know when that's going to be uh, resolved. So I, I do recall we had some problems in 4 with uh, Material. Uh, I believe that they were filed as issues. We tracked them. We, we hunted them down and, and squashed those bugs. So if there are any other remaining bugs with Universal and Angular Material, uh, let me know, and we can escalate that and get that, that resolved uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, when it comes to feature parity with AngularJS material, um, I believe we are uh, virtually there. Um, if, if there's anything that's missing, so I mean, we put all of the things from AngularJS material in our roadmap uh, that, that you can see on GitHub, uh, and we've kind of been one by one knocking them out, and I, I think there's very few things less left. Um, I don't know if we had an action list uh, back in AngularJS material. I don't remember how sophisticated our data table was. Um, and so I, I think at this point, we're, we're kind of, we feel like we have feature parity and we're moving over into kind of new features. Um, but if there's something missing, please, please let us know. I think we've come a long way in the last six months in terms of feature parity. I think six months ago, I would not say we had feature parity. That's when they did the POC, he says. <laughs> it, it was funny. I was talking to a developer uh, about his feelings about Angular. And he was like, oh, I get so frustrated with the documentation. I, I wish it was like this. And I pulled up the documentation. I'm like, it is like that. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, I haven't looked at it for two years. <laughs> OK, any, any one last question? Anybody, it's getting pretty late. Uh, Steven, thank you so much uh, for coming out here virtually uh, through the cloud. Um, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, you can either message me on Twitter, so at Steven, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-F-L-U-I-N, uh, on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, or come see me at meetups, conferences, et cetera. Hopefully, okay. you guys will invite me to Seattle one of these times. Smile. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're taking a selfie. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, all right, yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Bye. Thank you. All right. <laughs>